But I'm glad you're here, and we are going to finish up Romans today. And like many aspects of life, when you're finishing something up, whatever it may be, you're hoping you can end that something with, with like a big bang. You, you really want to end on a high note, you know what I mean? Like you want to be at the top of the list. But I want you to listen to at least part of the text we are left with this morning. Um, I'm going to throw a wrench in the, in the thing here. I'm going to be reading out of the CSB this morning. So just throwing you off. Didn't want to keep you on your toes. This is what it says. Starting from Romans 16, starting at verse 1. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church in Chinchoria. So you should welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever matter she may require your help. For indeed, she has been a benefactor of many and also, and of me also. Give my greetings to Prisca or uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus, who risk their own necks for my life. Not only do I thank them, but so do all the Gentile churches. Greet also the church that meets in their home. G greet my dear friend Epatinus, Epatinus, who is the first convert to Christ from Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews and fellow prisoners. They are noteworthy in the eyes of the apostles, and they were also in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Statius. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet those who belong to the house of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphene and Tryphosi. Tryphosa, who have worked hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, also his mother and mine. Greet Eccentricus, uh, Phlegion, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brothers and sisters who are with them. Greet Philogus, Julia, uh, Nerusus, Nerusus, and his sister and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send you greetings. Woo! All right, I got through it, kind of. You get to this, and it's name after name, after name I can't pronounce, after another name I can't pronounce, and it finally ends with a kiss. Name, 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 kiss. <laughs> I thought, okay, well, maybe I could do something with the kiss part. Because what are you going to do with all these names? Name after name after name. Bible reading 101. We all know this. When you get to a list of names, you skip it. And you go to the next thing where there's something important, right? I mean, you don't know how to pronounce them. You don't know where they're from. You don't know anything about them. So you just jump right over them and get to the good stuff. Several years ago article was written by a nursing student. It was written in Guidepost, and in the article, she told about taking a pop quiz. She said, I, I was a conscientious student, and I breezed through the questions until I read the last one. What is the first name of the woman who cleans the school? I thought, surely this is some kind of joke. I'd seen the cleaning woman several times. She was tall. She had dark hair. She was in her 50s but how would I know her name? I handed in my paper, leaving that last question blank. Before class ended, one of the students asked if the last question would count toward our quiz grade. Oh, absolutely, said the professor. In your careers, you will meet many people. All are significant. They deserve your attention and care, even if all you can do is smile and say hello. The student reading, writing the article concluded the article by saying this, I've never forgotten that lesson. Oh, and by the way, I also learned her name. It was Dorothy. I wonder sometimes if there isn't more significance in lists of names than we give the list of names. 
In fact, here in this list, it is as, as if Paul is doing this roll call of the church. You know, he's listing off these people that have been instrumental in his ministry who have partnered with him, who, who have been there. This is not Paul talking about the, the, the group of supporters in a mailing list. This is Paul talking about those people who he did life with. That's, that's what he's talking about here. That's the list of people. He's, he's listing off people that he's done life and ministry with. So he lists all these names. I was thinking about that, and I remember this article I'd read way back when. It was in 2015, I think. But uh, anyway, uh, GQ magazine was interviewing uh, basketball star uh, Kobe Bryant, who has passed away since then. But he was asking him about if he had any friends. And he says, well, Kobe Bryant responded, well, I have like minds. You know, I, I've been fortunate to play in Los Angeles where there are a lot of people like me, actors, musicians, businessmen, obsessives, people who like God, excuse me, people who, uh, who like, uh, excuse me, I cannot read, people who think that God put them on earth to do whatever it is they do. Now, do we have time to build great relationships? Do we have time to build great friendships? No. Do we have time to socialize and hang out aimlessly? No. Do we want to do that? No. We want to work. I enjoy working. The interviewer followed up with this question. Well, do you miss the idea of a great friendship? And Kobe Bryant replied, well, of course. I'm not like, it's not like I'm saying I don't need friends because I'm that strong. It is a weakness. It is a weakness. I just want you to understand, no friends is a weakness. If you don't have friends in your life, that's not strength on your part. That is a weakness. I would trade, I would not trade my relationships with friends and family, my relationships with my faith family for all the money in this world. You couldn't pay me enough to trade in uh, that my friendships, my relationships with others for money. We, 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 th there's nothing this world could offer me that is as valuable to me as the groups of people that surround my life. And so we often come to Paul and we look at him and we think, well, Paul, he's like that Lone Ranger missionary. He's out there doing mission work kind of on his own. He has one or two tontos that hang around every once in a while, but it's pretty much him. You know, that's what we look like. But Paul makes it clear here that's not true. That's not true at all. In fact, he has a large group of people that he's connected to, and he's mentioning them to this church in Rome. Which led me to something that we under, need to understand. As we close out this book of Romans, this book where Paul is writing this letter, where he's writing to this church and encouraging him, we need to recognize some of the things we need to do. And one of the things we need to do is we need to welcome people into our lives. We need to be welcoming people into our lives. Now there's this perception, like I said, that Paul was kind of the unapproachable guy. In fact, a lot of people think Paul was misogynistic and he didn't like women that much, especially in the church and partnering, partnering in kingdom work. But that's not true. There are 26 names here in this list I just read you, plus two allusions to other people. He doesn't name them, but he talks about them. Out of that list, there are nine women. And the very first person mentioned in this list was Phoebe, a woman. And apparently, Phoebe was so important to Paul's ministry that she is the one who is bringing his letter to the church in Rome, and it appears that she is probably financing the trip as well. This woman is extremely important to the ministry. I know that Paul didn't have the same relationship with all these people as he has with every single person, but Paul had a relationship with these people. You know, that's the thing. We, we kind of get confused, I believe. We kind of get things mixed up. We don't always have to have the same relationships with everyone, but we do need to have relationships with others. You know, my, my relationship with one person and another person may be a little bit different. One may be closer, one may be on a different area, but that doesn't mean that I care about one or the other more or less. That just means I have a different relationship with one than the other. 
But the point is, I have a relationship. He made a priority out of inviting people into his life. And you and I need to make a priority out of inviting people into our life. We need to have relationships with one another. There's an interesting take. Uh, the New King James Version, I like how it takes Proverbs 18, verse 24. New King James says, A man with many friends may be harmed, but there is a friend who stays closer than a brother. That is not the right translation. I put the wrong one on there. The New King James says something to this effect. A man who has friends is friendly. A man who has friends is friendly. And there is a friend who sticks closer to a than, than a brother. A man who has friends is friendly. Here's the point. As Christians, we, you and I, have a responsibility to open up our lives to other people. Now, sometimes I hear this complaint. Well, Todd, you know, they didn't invite me into their lives. They didn't invite me into that group. They didn't invite me in to participate in this or that or something else. That may be true. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm not calling anybody a liar. I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, that happened. I, okay. But guess what? It's not only their responsibility. Guess who else's responsibility it is? Mine. I have to invite them into my life. Sometimes I think we don't have the relationships we could have because we're not involved in making those relationships. We're waiting for someone else to make them with us rather than us make them with them. We need to be inviting people into our lives. If you want someone in your life, go invite them in there. Say, hey, come over for dinner. Come over for whatever. You know, most of the time the preacher's going to come for dinner, you know, especially if it's steak or something like that. You know? By the way, what about this kiss? The kiss was at the end of here. That was kind of the normal greeting of the society, this kiss thing. But in the church, it kind of took a little step farther than that. In the, in the church, the, it kind of pictured this deeper fellowship that they had than just the acquaintances of society. It, it was a deeper fe fellowship. You know, you go into a business somewhere, and, and you might shake someone's hand. Hey, I'm Todd Wolf, and you are, and they'll tell your name, shake hand. Okay, all right. But in the church, when you get a little closer to someone, what do you do? You grab them by the hand, you pull them in, you put your other arm around them, and you give them that, I love you. It's the handshake hug thing that a guy can do, you know. <laughs> but, but it means something more. It means not just I'm greeting you this morning, but there's something we have relationally today. John 15, Jesus says in verses 12 and 13, this is my commandment, love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay one's life down for one's friend. That's what Paul's illustrating here. He's saying these people were willing to lay down their lives for me. These people were willing to sacrifice for me. We love each other like Jesus loves us. In fact, he says exactly that in four, verse 4 of our text. He says, they risk their own necks for my life, Priscilla and Aquila. We need to be inviting people into that kind of relationship. Listen, am I going to let you down? Of course I am. Is anyone else in here going to let you down or everyone else in here going to let you down? Probably. Probably. What does that matter? You can still be <coughs> friends with them. Have you ever been let down by a family member? Anybody ever do something wrong to you by a family member? You still love them and you care about them. Even if they said something that hurt your feelings. That's the relationship we need to have with one another. We want to welcome people into our lives and we want to keep them in our lives. We want to keep them in our lives. The second thing we need to learn from this list of names is that we need to commend, honor, and celebrate our faith family. We need to commend and honor and celebrate our faith family. That's, that's pretty much what Paul is doing here. To a large extent, that's what he's doing. He's honoring, celebrating, commending, giving thanks for those who have shared in his ministry. I mean, for instance, Phoebe, she serves, he says. She helps. She supports the church and supports my ministry. Priscilla and Aquila, or Prisca and Aquila, they risk their lives for me. They host believers in their homes. By the way, we're starting up connection groups and I need some homes that will host believers in their homes. A scriptural following, you know, an example that we could follow. So if you want to 
host believers in your home, come find me and talk to me. Mary says she worked hard. Andrew Cuss and Junior, they, they spent time in prison for Christ. They were praised by the apostles. Uh, tri uh, Tryphena and Tryphosa were twins. By the way, their names mean dainty and delicate. And Paul says these, this dainty and delicate twins, these dainty and delicate twins are hard workers. Are hard workers. And then Rufus. Well, specifically Rufus' mother. I like this one. Rufus' mother. Apparently Rufus' mother treated Paul like he was her child too. In fact, as I was preparing the sermon, it started me thinking, you know, I imagine this. Paul, Rufus' mother would say, I don't know what her name was because it doesn't tell us, but Paul, um, you, you've been working on that letter all day. It's time for you to come sit down and, and eat with us. You know, you need to take a break, Paul. Come on over here to the table and eat with us for a little while. Sit down and, and finish a meal. And by the way, those vegetables are good for you, Paul, so you need to eat those up too. You know, eat those up as well. There's so many of my sisters and brothers here that mean so very much to me and to the kingdom, and I'll just be honest with you, to my fault... You know, it's my error. I have not expressed to them how much they mean to me. And I need to do a better job of that. And maybe you do too. Romans 1, Paul says this. Same group of people. First, I thank my God through Christ Jesus for all of you because the news of your faith is being reported in all the world. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul says it like this, I give thanks to God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we must always thank God for you, brothers, which is fitting since your faith is flourishing and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. He goes on. <laughs> Therefore, we ourselves boast about you among God's churches, about your endurance and faith and all the persecutions and afflictions you endure. Paul says, I thank God for you. I thank God for my church family. I thank God for my faith family. I thank God because you are consistent. I thank God because you are persistent. I thank God because you stand up. You share in the ministry with me. You're telling others the good news. You're living it out. You are partners in kingdom work, and I thank God. I honor you, and I want you to know how much you mean to me. I want you to know how much you mean to me. A quarter of a century ago, a middle-aged pastor with a, was writing, his, his name, a pastor and writer was named William Stigger. He's reflecting on his gratitude uh, for a teacher that he had as a youth. The teacher had introduced him to great literature and had sparked his love for the written word and it helped him prepare for future vocations. He realized he had never thanked her for the way she had touched his life. So he decided that he was going to atone for that and rectify it. And so he, that very night he penned a letter and sent it to her. A few days later, he received a reply. It was written in a shaky scrawl, and this is how it read. It said, dear, my dear Willie, I am now an old lady in my 80s, living alone in a small room, cooking my own meals, lonely and seemingly like the last leaf of fall left behind. You'll be interested to know, Willie, that I taught school for 50 years, and in all that time, yours is the first note of appreciation I ever received. It came on a blue, cold morning, and it cheered my lonely old heart as nothing has cheered me in many years. Think of all the people here and throughout your walk in faith, wherever they may have been, that have supported you and encouraged you and walked with you through the struggles? Have you told them how much they mean to you? Have you honored them, celebrated what they do, and commended them to others? That's what Paul does. 
That's what Paul is doing here with this roll call. <clears throat> now he moves from the roll call and he goes on. Verse 17 and 18, this is what he says. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who create division and obstacles contrary to the teaching that you learn. Avoid them. Because such people do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of unsuspecting, of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. So Paul moves on, he tells us the third thing we need to do, and that is we need to protect one another. Now, Paul, after listing off all these names, he moves on to this other group, this group of people who are being destructive in the church. So there's this group of people that have been uh, involved in his ministry, supporting him, would go to the death for him, die for him. And then he mentions this other group of people that are causing trouble. And he says, you need to protect yourself in the church. He says, watch out for these troublemakers. Avoid them. In fact, his description says this. They are creators of division. They make obstacles. They serve their own agenda. They influence others through smooth and flattering tongues. <laughs> they used to be called someone with a silver tongue. Now, a person with a silver tongue is a person who could sell ice cream to an Eskimo or whatever. They, they, I was a person who could convince you to do something that wasn't good for you and while you're doing it, you think it's, think it's a great thing. That's, that's what he's talking about here. These smooth talkers who have their own agenda in mind and, and have a way of persuading and, and, and getting people to agree with them. In fact, Proverbs 26 describes the same kind of person like this. Smooth words may hide a wicked heart just as a pretty glaze covers a clay pot. People may cover their hatred with pleasant words, but they're deceiving you. They pretend to be kind, but don't believe them. Their hearts are full of many evils. He said, there, there are those in the church, he's saying, that you need to watch out for because intentionally or unintentionally, they are creating division and they are putting up obstacles and, and they are getting in the way. They're convincing others what is untrue and they're creating issues. We're called to keep an eye out for the same thing. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, it says, Let no one deceive you with empty arguments, for because of these things, God's wrath is coming on the disobedient. Let no one deceive you. Let no one get you off course. Let no one throw you into turmoil. Keep on the right track. In the first book, Fellowship of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien describes the camaraderie of a diverse group of people. They have banded together for a common cause. They are called the Fellowship of the Ring and their quest is to destroy the power of the Dark Lord lodged in his ring. Though they differ in nearly every aspect, uh, racially or physically, temperamentally, they're united in their opposition of the Dark Lord. And in a section omitted by the movie, a heated conflict breaks out among the Crusaders. Axes are drawn, bows are bent, harsh words are spoken, and disaster nearly strikes this small band to obliter uh, into oblivion. But indeed, one of the wise counselors observes, he says, indeed, in nothing is the power of the Dark Lord more clearly shown than, the, than in the estrangement that divides all those who still oppose him. The counselor says, you know that the power of the dark Lord is still there because he's getting people who oppose him to be in conflict with one another. Today, the dark Lord Satan shows his power when he spreads discord among believers. Even within a group that seems to have the same goals, like the church, division can creep in and try to destroy it if we are not vigilant and watching for it, which leads me to my last point, and that is that we need to keep our eye on the goal. Keep our eye on the goal. Uh, one sermon years ago, I, I, I mentioned keeping the main thing the main thing, and someone 
painted a, pla a, 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 a tile for me, and I have it at the house. I should have brought it over and shown it to you. But that's essentially what Paul closes this letter with. This is what he says. 25, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and proclamation about Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept silent for long ages, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic scriptures, according to command of the eternal God to advance the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles, to the only wise God through Christ, Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever. Amen. Paul says, as he closes this letter, and he just challenged him to watch out for this conflict, he says, keep your eyes on the goal. Your goal should not be to please people. Your goal should be to bring honor and glory to God. It's not about ourselves. It's not about individual congregations. It's living a life that pleases and honors God. And when we look more and more like Christ, all these other things happen. The more we try to please God, all the other things happen. We welcome people into our midst. We honor them. We protect them because we're trying to honor and please God with our lives. See, Paul reminds us at the end of this letter what we've been given, what we've been provided for by, by God. And he says, share that with other people and let other people know how much you appreciate how they've shared it with you. We pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all you've blessed us with. And I, I ask you, Lord, that each person here, myself included, that we would look for ways to welcome people into our lives, to communicate to them how much we love them and care for them and appreciate them. To protect them, keeping vigilant, looking out for things that could divide and, and try to conquer and, and dissuade and put up obstacles for the church. Lord, I pray that we would keep our eyes on the goal of bringing glory to you. Living lives that point people to you. Looking more and more like your son so that people get to know you. Lord, I pray for each one here. If there's things in our way, if there's things that are obstacles, if, if I've been a, a divider, I pray, Lord, that you will make that very clear to me, very clear to all of us. Help us, help us to love our family here more than, or in a more visible way than ever before. Thank you, God, for Paul and this book of Romans, and I pray that it will affect our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.